in regard to that in those five books? There may not be. If anybody knows these three gentlemen know. Is he talking about the American Medical Association <laughs> and the Pentateuch? <laughs> uh, that is not specified. I'm drawing a blank on it. I can't think of anything in the first five books that directly dealt with uh, ethics. Now, there were a number of rules that were found uh, that they had to practice. Most of them, though, I think as Macmillan has pointed out in a book called None of These Diseases, had to do with uh, the circumstances, and uh, especially in trying to keep down uh, any spread of diseases, as well as uh, some that had uh, ceremonial purposes as well. But I can't think of uh, the ethical part. Uh, can you? Okay, we'll go Medi to Yeah, medical ethics today is, though, uh, I think a, a, a very wide field of study and needs to be because it involves cloning, it involves uh, uh, many practices that uh, doctors sometimes feel that they have a right uh, to do, uh, and uh, that even laws now begin to recognize such a starving people, not giving them any more food if they think they're going to die, and uh, allowing them to uh, starve and I'm not talking about those who are already brain dead. I'm talking about those that uh, may uh, have problems that they cannot recover from. And these are involved in ethical situations that doctors today uh, would deal with. There, there are passages that, as Hardiman has said, uh, I can't think of any direct... Uh, references, but there are a lot of passages that certainly have implications and from which ethical principles would need to be drawn. Uh, for example, in Exodus 21, you remember there's the discussion of two men uh, fighting with each other and they end up bumping into a pregnant woman and the woman gives birth. Uh, that passage has direct implications for the question of abortion. Uh, Deuteronomy 22, where um, there's injunctions about uh, your neighbor's animals that might get out. Uh, this is also the passage, is it not, where you're supposed to build a little parapet, a little fence around uh, your roof so that one of your neighbors doesn't happen to fall off. Um, there's injunctions about uh, a person who had an ox that had a reputation for trying to gore people and the implications of that. In fact, if you owned an ox and you had been warned that your ox tended to gore, and someone gets gored and killed, then you were to be executed. Uh, think of the implications of that ethically for uh, the pit bulls and the other circumstances that we're facing with people today. So there's a lot of principles that would probably yes. answer just almost everything that comes up. In fact, there was a case out in California not long ago of a pit bulldog that killed uh, killed someone and they had a trial. Yes. Yeah. Gary, do you have any insight? No, I'm afraid I don't. Hardeman's been preaching forever, and he hasn't even found it yet, so I think there's no, <laughs> there's no hope for the rest of us. <laughs> we have uh, two questions on situational ethics, and I'll read both of them. Is there ever a situation when it may be all right to do something which under normal circumstances would be wrong? And then right in connection with that, uh, is, is it harmful for even an elder in the church to maintain certain situation ethics in some uh, circumstances? So they go hand in hand there. Situation ethics. Dave? You said don't go into a lot of depth. The answer to the first question is no. The answer to the second question is no. <laughs> well, maybe a little more depth. <laughs> God has made laws in his infinite wisdom that um, can be obeyed under any circumstance. So there is never a time where it's appropriate to lie. Even though uh, Joseph Fletcher, the father of situation ethics, and a lot of people since uh, and before have come up with, you know, odd case scenario. Well, what about this situation? Uh, what if, you know, the Gestapo comes and you're hiding Jews and they say, are there any Jews here? You know, shouldn't you lie? Just come up with infinite 
uh, instances of, of cases where you're tempted to think God would have you to lie, but that's simply not the case. You know, in that instance, uh, you're not obligated by God to tell them anything. So there's always uh, other options. Sometimes they say, well, here are the only two options. You know, it's either this or this. No, that's not true. There are many options. But God would not have made these laws and said, you must obey these laws, and then turn around and said, but, you know, if things aren't exactly right or you find a unique situation, then you don't have to do that. We've had our own brethren say there are instances where it would be acceptable for you to lie. And they often go to Rahab the harp. But that is a misunderstanding, a misstudy of that passage. The Bible does not condone her lying or anyone else anytime ever. That was one of the Ten Commandments, wasn't it? There are no exceptions to that. Are there exceptions to adultery? Maybe sometimes, somewhere, Adultery would be appropriate. Or maybe homosexuality. Under normal circumstances, same-sex relations is wrong. But, you know, if it saves 500 people, let's say. You know, Saddam Hussein says, unless you have sexual relations with an animal, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to execute 500 Iraqis. I'm sorry. That's wrong. Bestiality is wrong. Brought the death penalty under the Old Testament. And there are no exceptions. Hardiman. There is also the fact that sometimes uh, there are laws that God did not make, that man makes, that ought to be kept by a Christian because he's to obey the laws of the land. But there is a responsibility, as the Bible teaches, for us to respect the higher law if there comes to be a uh, dichotomy between man's law and God's law, and therefore God's higher law must take precedence over the laws of men. So in Acts chapter 5, the apostles said, we ought to obey God rather than men. They had been commanded not to teach at all, nor speak in the name of Jesus. They couldn't obey God and obey that law of man. Normally, under most circumstances, there would be the situation where they could obey both. But if there was a conflict, then the higher law of God had to be obeyed. And uh, that is not uh, something that changes. Uh, if they threaten them, they beat them, and ultimately kill them for obeying the law of God, they still had to obey the law of God. God's law is an immutable law and should be treated in just that fashion. So there are times where situations place laws against each other. Now then, in such cases, which law do we obey? Man's law or God's law? God's law must not be replaced by any human court. Very good. Gary? I agree with what Dave said regarding... Um, sinful actions, prohibitions, that sort of thing. But I think that if we um, consider another category, and that is duties that God gives us to perform, then yes, there are circumstances in which it would be wrong to fail, uh, I mean, under normal circumstances, it'd be wrong to fail in doing that duty, but in exceptional circumstances, it would not be wrong. And uh, you all remember, I'm sure, that uh, in Old Testament times, uh, someone who was traveling uh, during the time of the uh, Passover was um, permitted to um, uh, do something out of the ordinary. I think the same thing applies today. Somebody's sick and uh, unable to meet with the saints and therefore unable to take the Lord's Supper, it's not wrong for that person to stay home and recover. But under normal circumstances, it would be wrong to do that. So when it comes to positive duties, there are exceptions. When it comes to negative prohibitions, then I agree with what Dave already said. And I think that sometimes there are laws that God has given uh, that generally apply to uh, man and his welfare. There are other laws that God has given that apply to our responsibilities to him. Uh, for instance, uh, Jesus' teaching concerning the Sabbath. 
that uh, on the Sabbath they were not to uh, work at all. And his disciples were coming through the grain fields and they rubbed the grain that they were lawfully allowed to pick from the edge of the fields. That wasn't the violation. But they rubbed the grain and blew off the chaff and ate the grain. Now in doing the rubbing and the threshing, the <clears throat> Pharisees said, you violated God's law. And yet Jesus' point was that the Sabbath was made for man. He went back and gave the example of David. Now remember, these dealt with ceremonies. And in that case, ceremony was not to be placed above the value of the man. And uh, the man had the higher value, and his welfare took uh, uh, even precedence over that. Sometimes today, uh, people say there can be no <clears throat> exception to any of even the ceremonial laws. But Jesus gave examples of some of those ceremonial laws that on occasion could be broken. He told how that David and his group, uh, fleeing from the wrath of Saul, ate the showbread, which it wasn't lawful for a man to eat under normal circumstances. The exception was, where is the higher loyalty? Is it to the showbread that's not lawful for one to eat under ordinary circumstances, or to the welfare of David and his troops that were traveling with him? On that occasion, the very example that Jesus gave pointed out the higher loyalty the benefit for man. And sometimes that's misused. I heard of one fellow that always was missing services, but he was always saying the ox was in the ditch, which was another thing that Jesus used as an example of higher loyalty, an ox. And uh, uh, so he uh, would be in the ditch on the Sabbath. Could they get them out? Yes, they could. Was that work? Yes. But the value of the animal was placed above the law of normally not working upon the Sabbath. And Jesus gave that as an example. He said, You're, we're worth far more than the animal. And so there were examples. This fellow was always saying, well, the ox was in the ditch every time he had missed the services. Yeah. And uh, so the preacher finally told him one day, he said, what you need to do is either to sell that ox or fill up the ditch. Dave, do you have anything to add? I would uh, probably word it a little bit different, Gary. I would say that uh, not so much that there are exceptions, but that the law contains within it circumstances that, uh, that differ. You know, for example, uh, if you are a Christian, you are required by God to worship Him in spirit and in truth in the forms that He has stipulated, one of those forms being to sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. What if you were born without a larynx or uh, you have an injury that causes you to be unable to speak for the rest of your life? I do not believe your failure to sing from that point forward is a violation of the law. God would not give you a law that you are incapable of keeping. And so inbuilt into God's laws are these circumstances, exceptions, whatever. You know, that's a good instance of uh, on your way to services and you're in a car wreck and you're rushed by ambulance to the hospital near death. Obviously, you're going to forsake the assembly. <laughs> but uh, I do not believe that's a, vi uh, a violation of, of the New Testament. I wanted to comment quickly on uh, David in 1 Samuel chapter 21. In my opinion, what, what is happening there is that uh, David is undoubtedly violating the law of Moses and doing so in an inexcusable and unacceptable way. And Jesus' reference to him in Matthew chapter 12, again, in my opinion, is an example of uh, argumentum ad hominem, where Jesus was saying, look, uh, you fellas back, support, and approve of David, even though he clearly violated the law. And yet here are my disciples who have not violated the law. You know, he, uh, Exodus 12, 16 said that you could, um, and Deuteronomy 23, 25 are relevant passages to Matthew 12, but the idea being that uh, not only could you pluck from a neighbor's field, but you could do that on Saturday. 
In other words, the, the Sabbath law did not enjoin total inactivity. You know, if we think it did, then that, that's part of our problem in misunderstanding that. There are a number of things that not only were authorized, but commanded. You know, <coughs> Jesus goes ahead in that chapter and refers to the priestly activity, where they do things on Saturday they're obligated to do. So it's not that God has placed one law against another. It's that in keeping one law, another example of that would be John 7 where Jesus says, you know, when you are to circumcise your male infant on the eighth day after his birth, if that eighth day after birth falls on Saturday, you still circumcise the child, and that is not a violation of the Sabbath. So, and my understanding of Matthew 12 is that uh, he's using a logical strategy and saying, David clearly violated the law. You know, in 1 Samuel 21, that's not all David did. He also lied on that occasion. He just flat lied. He told uh, Ahimelech, I'm here on the king's business. That wasn't true. He was running from the king. And um, Jesus used that example to say, this shows the inconsistency of you fellows. It shows your hearts. It shows you you're not interested in applying the Bible correctly and obeying it accurately. Because you approve of David when he violated the law, you condemn my disciples when they didn't. Gary, there's a <clears throat> passage that comes to mind. Uh, I think everybody remembers that um, Abraham was commanded by God to offer up his son, was he not? And uh, he set out to do that very thing. <clears throat> in Hebrews chapter 11, there is reference made to this. And in verse 17, the inspired writer says, By faith, Abraham, being tried, offered up Isaac past tense, and yet he didn't. Uh, how, how is it possible that it could say this? Because Abraham was in the process of doing that with full intention of doing that to the best of his ability, going to obey God, and by circumstances was prevented from doing that. The circumstances in this case, God himself stopping him in the act. But God accounted Abraham's attempt to obey that as if he had actually done it. And therefore, uh, when it comes to, uh, and the example Dave gave about uh, the command to sing and somebody doesn't have a voice, uh, we might also mention Romans 10 verse 9, if you shall confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, what if a person is, is mute and cannot speak a word? Is it all right to write his confession on paper? Uh, certainly so. In, in those exceptional circumstances uh, because this person is prevented, this, in this case by the providence of God, from being able to fulfill what God himself expected. And so there are certainly exceptions uh, whereby God will not hold us accountable for any uh, lack or, or negligence simply because we were unable to uh, fulfill the duties enjoined upon us. Very good. Uh, here is a more contemporary type question. Please address Christians who regularly violate the copyright laws of our land by using software or copying movies or other things pertaining to those matters without proper authorization just doing it. Which one wants to answer first? doubt that very many who use uh, computers are not aware of the warnings that are on there about copyright laws, and they ought to be very careful to obey them. Churches need to do that as well with music. Uh, it is a violation of the law to take a copyrighted song and reproduce it and put it even on a screen. So there are offerings of copyright rights or legal rights to those things through companies that have gotten them copyrighted. We ought to obey those laws. Now some may violate some law not knowing that it is the law, but they ought to learn the law if these warnings are so clearly displayed as they are generally on the internet. I'm not an internet user to that extent. I know how to look up my email and that's it. And I wish there'd be some way to block everything that comes on that. 
Uh, my problem would not only be with violating the copyright, but what is a Christian doing copying some of those movies? <laughs> Gary? You know, the copyright laws have changed or evolved uh, through the years, and sometimes people studied it from how it was years ago, and they think it stayed that way. It's kind of like the English language. It doesn't stay static. It keeps evolving as... Uh, as our technology and, uh, and experience changes. Uh, it used to be that you had to make a claim of copyright in order to have a copyright. Now that law is changed where if you just put your name on something, that is considered copyright. And uh, I think some brethren are not aware of that. I, I discovered that that must be the case when I found an article that I had written reproduced in a church bulletin under somebody else's name. Uh, he changed two or three words, and I guess salved his conscience by those two or three word changes, and then put it out under his own name. And uh, plagiarism is wrong, and uh, as well as these other things. I've had that happen to me numbers of times. Hard of I think that... Uh with reference to copyrights, not only do they change, but they're in the process of changing right now. Uh, there is a law that was introduced, I think, yesterday uh, that uh, they hope to pass to extend the copyright laws even longer than they are to protect songs and, and things that uh, are going to be soon available unless uh, that law is changed. Uh, a number of years ago, you could have a copyright for 26 and a half years. If you renewed it, you could do it for almost that equivalent time again. After that, it became what is called public domain. That probably has caused the King James translation to be so popular because it's public domain. Uh, it may be why other new translations have been put out too so that they can get the copyright uh, royalties off of them. They may not have been too interested in uh, just distributing the Word of God, but putting out a new translation because their copyrights on the other ones were running out. And uh, if they could get one that was very popular into publication, then they had royalties off of every copy that was printed, not just sold, but that was printed. This discussion brings to mind uh, <clears throat> something else. There is evidently a brother in the church who is the most prolific writer of, of any of us. His name is Selected. <laughs> uh, I have seen his works uh, here and there and everywhere. And, and what, what happens is some preacher, uh, maybe Maxie, let's say, writes an article, puts it in the church bulletin, and the next week or the next month, it's in somebody else's bulletin off somewhere else with Maxie's name deleted. They didn't want to give him credit for it, so they just put selected at the bottom. And brethren, I believe that is absolutely unethical. Amen. We're here to discuss ethics, and when you remove a man's name from a work that he has done, you, uh, th this is just unethical. There's no two ways about it. If you want to reproduce his article, then give him credit for his work. I had a fellow come by my office one day when I preached in Corsicana, and he had produced a book wherein he used 15 of my articles and had given me credit for three of them. And he came in sort of apologetic-like, and he said, Now, you may be a little upset with me, but I used some of your articles and didn't give you credit for all of them. And uh, he showed them to me, and I, I said, well, may I ask you why you gave me credit for three of them but didn't give me credit for ten of them? And he said, well, I didn't want to be redundant. <laughs> I said, hmm, yeah. Well, he had a bunch of other fellows' articles in there, and he gave some of them credit and some of them he didn't. I think that I agree wholeheartedly with Gary. That's just outright wrong. Dave? Well, uh, kind of an extension of what you just said, um, Notice that if this fellow had come into Maxie and said, will you give me permission to publish these articles under my name, even if Maxie gave him permission to do that, it would still be unethical. 
I did that one time. A fellow said, could, could I take some of your material? And, and I said, sure. You know, and then I thought later, wait a minute. I'm sanctioning him misrepresenting and being deceitful. So he would have needed to give some indication even though he could use the material. So that's something to think about too. People can't give you permission to do something that's wrong. This might be uh, confession time, but when I was in, <laughs> in, when I was in college, Brother W. Claude Hall was one of my teachers. I loved and admired him and still do totally. He was one of the finest teachers I ever had in any way. And uh, Brother Hall would make a speech every year in chapel against drinking coffee and Coca-Colas. I was editor of the annual, and I had the photographer to take a picture of Brother Hall on the front steps of the administration building. And then I had him to draw on his shoulders one of these Eat at Joe's signs, and we put drink Coca-Cola on it. I didn't ask his permission. Was that uh, a violation of ethics? <laughs> Whenever the annual came out, he got up in chapel and said, evidently Nichols has never heard of slander <laughs> and plagiarism. I looked up the word. <laughs> That's sort of like the picture that Don Simpson drew of the teachers in the school one time and had Johnny Ramsey with a little sign in his pocket, I believe in Santa Claus. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. Any more comments on this? If not, here's an akin question, and I'm not sure what all is entailed in this uh, question, but please address the issue of ethical conduct among our brotherhood papers. That might be somewhat overlapping, but maybe some difference there. Dave? I'll start it. My observation is that we have a number of brethren that uh, hear about something. In fact, that's what I'd call it, hearsay. And apparently it's, it's credible to the person who hears it because it comes from somebody they trust. They believe, well, he wouldn't lie to me. And he goes to print. Our brethren have been doing that for years. And just over the years, I've documented case after case after case where something was reported prematurely. You know, um, the National Enquirer apparently sells lots of copies and makes billions of dollars, don't they? From Probably from a lot of people that would say, well, I don't read that stuff. And they thrive on that, making up stuff. That suggests that there's something about human beings, maybe human nature, where we, we seem to want to believe things that we hear that are negative and ugly. And um, I'm telling you that our brethren are guilty of this on a wide scale. There's all kinds of stuff being printed and published and spoken. And um, in fact, I feel very guilty. When it's done to me, it's caused me to stop and say, well, how many times have I believed what someone has told me about someone? And it may not be true at all. Sometimes I think we think it's true. When we pass something on, we think it's true. But the Bible teaches things are not always what they seem. Things can have the appearance of being a certain way, and it's not that way at all. And for us to just go right on and spread that like we know for, for a fact that that's the case, we could very easily be guilty of doing things that the Bible condemns as absolutely wicked. For example, in Proverbs uh, 7, among the things that God hates, Proverbs 6, 6 16. sowing discord among brethren, you know, bearing false witness was uh, under the law of Moses, also one of the Ten Commandments that, uh, you know, God, He is intensely angry with that. And uh, on, even on the low, that's brotherhood wide. Think on the local level, how much gossip and innuendo and talk spreads among people. And uh, when you hear that and it's been worded to you in such a way that it seems as if they're saying it boldly like they really know it's true, then you lock it into your mind as true. You then repeat it. Pretty soon it's spread all over. And then people think, well, so many people have said this is true. It must be true. 
even though if you could trace it back, if we were omniscient, could trace it all back, it started from just one or two people and just spread to others. Sins of the tongue are probably going to cause more people to be lost than many of the things that we think people will be lost over. Pardon Ethics not only deals with uh, the rule, but it deals with the motive back of it, the spirit back of it. What is the intent of saying these things? Uh, and then, what is the end of it? What's the purpose of it? And very often, people have failed to see the way God has designed the local congregations as being autonomous, self-governing. And even in Acts 15, whenever a matter came up in another country, in Antioch, about what is to be done with these that say, we've come from the Jerusalem brethren, and they say, Paul, that you must circumcise all these Gentiles you're converting. And unless they keep the law, they can't be saved. Well, naturally, it caused a great discussion there. But what did they do about the matter? They first went back to its source. They went down to Jerusalem. Now, Paul points out in Galatians, the second chapter, that he didn't go down to learn what the truth was about circumcision as to whether Gentiles ought to be circumcised. He knew the truth. He had been preaching the truth. But he went down there, he pointed out, by revelation. You see, God even revealed that this is the way to handle those matters. Go back to its source. And so he went back to Jerusalem. The matter came up in the public assembly down there. They didn't discuss it in the public assembly and settle it there. The record says, and the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. That's all we know about that private meeting except the consequences of it. Because they're back in the assembly at the next verse. And they're telling the assembly what their decision has been. First, Peter tells how God selected him to preach to the Gentiles in Acts 10, but didn't command them to be circumcised. Next, Paul and Barnabas tell about their work and, and what has been accomplished. And then James gives the decision that has been made by the apostles and elders. And then they send out a letter and they point out these brethren lied when they went up to Antioch and said what they did. To whom we gave no such commandment. Well, that's the way it ought to be handled. Now imagine that if that had been today, there probably would have been some self-appointed editor that would have printed it in his paper and either defended what those said, because after all, they said they'd come from the Jerusalem church, and published it. You know, the Roman Catholic Church has its pope, and someone has said the Church of Christ has its editors. Well, I don't believe every editor needs to be placed in that category. But they all need to have ethics. What is your motive? What is your right, your rule, and what is your purpose? And if it's just to destroy the character of another, then you need to be very careful about printing anything on that basis. You, got anything uh, you know, <clears throat> that, that was a wonderful um, um, statement, uh, Hardman, and I appreciate that. Uh, everything you said, and it brings to mind that uh, there are all, there's also another category, I think, that needs to be addressed. We may inadvertently uh, make a mistake simply because we haven't looked into something enough. I mean, with all good intention, we may represent something a certain way, and uh, 
and just actually be mistaken about it, not because of any evil intent that we had. In fact, the, the subject under consideration might not even be a bad subject in, in the first place. It might simply be a case of inaccuracy. And I think we all have an obligation to try to be as accurate as possible, especially when representing the Word of God. I'll give you a case in point. This may seem like a very insignificant matter, uh, and maybe it is, uh, but it, it nevertheless fails, uh, doesn't fail to catch my attention because I see it so much. I don't know how many times over the years I have seen brethren write or say in sermons that Jesus died in 33 AD or that the church was established in 33 AD, and I wondered how they got their information. Um, I don't think it happened in 33 AD. The best uh, chronologers of, uh, of the calendar and the history of the times um, would indicate that happened in 30 AD. Um, maybe they could be off by a year or two, it's possible. Um, but in any case, it couldn't be 33 AD. And I think the reason why some people say that is because they're simply remembering that Jesus was 33 years old when he died. Well, in that case, it would be 34 AD because he wasn't just 33, he was about 33 and a half. He'd be halfway through the 34th year. And so there is no way that the church was established in 33 AD unless chronologers are three years off in their, in their calendar. Uh, that's just a, a very minute point, but I think a lot of times we make the same mistake regarding other biblical information and simply misrepresent it because we haven't looked into it enough. And I think we have an obligation to study diligently and represent God's uh, word accurately. I was just going to give you a quick example in Acts chapter 21. Do you remember that... Um, some of the Jews that uh, Paul, with, with whom Paul had to deal accused him of uh, defiling the temple by br bringing non-Jews in there. And the text says in Acts chapter 21, verse 29, they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with him, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. There's an example of what I'm talking about. You go down further in the chapter, and um, Paul is being uh, interrogated and uh, in verse 38, uh, the uh, Roman commander says, uh, then you're not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? And he said, I'm, I'm a Jew of Tarsus in Cilicia. Where did that commander get that idea? Where did these Jews get the idea that he had taken? Well, they saw him with this fellow. And it doesn't take very much then to put two and two together and jump to a conclusion and an assumption. And we do that all the time about each other. Any other comments on that question? We have another here that's quite interesting and uh, in this day and age is quite frequently uh, done and that is the declaration of bankruptcy on the part of one who may be a Christian. Romans 13 verse 8 says to owe no man anything. What if a Christian's uh, obligations regarding debts uh, what is his obligation regarding debts if he, if he declares bankruptcy? Does that alleviate him of those debts? And this person expressed, no, they didn't think so. But let's hear what you fellas have to say. Hardiman? I don't think that if one takes bankruptcy and cannot pay at the time, if they get able to pay, they ought to pay it. Uh, and uh, they may be forced into bankruptcy. Some do not voluntarily take it. They may be forced into it. And if such is the case, they ought to try to pay it. I think there was one example that uh, I knew about a number of years ago where a man's father owed a huge sum of money and went bankrupt. His son paid every dime of that huge sum back even after the man himself was dead. I think that that shows a great ethical attitude. He wasn't under obligation to do it. His name wasn't on anything, but he did it because he wanted 
the name that he wore to have some real honest qualities about it. His love for God was such that he wanted to do things honest. And I think that's a wonderful ethical practice. Either of you other gentlemen have anything to say? It's certainly not wrong to, to have a debt. You know, sometimes people take things in, um, in absolute ways that Scripture does not intend it. If somebody took Romans 13.8 and tried to make a case that it was wrong, that it would be wrong for, for a Christian to own a credit card or, or have an installment account or uh, have a debt of some kind, uh, that would be pressing the words of that verse beyond their intended meaning. And that this can be demonstrated to be true, what I'm saying right here, I think uh, can, be, uh, can come from the fact that Jesus said, give to him who asks and to him who would borrow, turn not away. And Jesus certainly wouldn't be condoning a man borrowing something if it was sinful to do that. So we can borrow money and uh, pay it back. And, uh, and therefore not to be violating scripture, this scripture simply because we incur a debt. It's how we pay that back and, uh, and the honesty with which we pay that back that is the key thing. And, and also wouldn't you agree that um, the spirit of what God is getting at is that you and I should not indulge our fleshly appetites to the point that we get ourselves in trouble. In other words, um, is, it, is it legitimate debt? Um, I remember a School of Preaching student that came and, uh, and said, uh, you know, I broke my glasses and uh, I need some more money. Now, wouldn't you have given that boy money for his glasses? He has to be able to see. I said, well, just answer one question for me. Uh, what was the last purchase you made with the money that you have for support? He said a pair of roller blades, 90 bucks. So I very sweetly and kindly, but I'm sure meanly, said, brother, we, we, can't, we can't help you anymore with that. In other words, you and I stand before God and give an account for how we use our money. And if we've gone and bought, you know, big houses and boats and cars and everything, then suddenly, oh, you know, I'm in debt and I need help. Well, you, you're going to have to justify the choices you made before God, aren't we? Uh, but I can envision a situation, uh, as these fellows have pointed out, where uh, you're forced into a situation and it wasn't due to your lusts and your desire to simply accumulate and so forth. That, that's possible that could happen, but as Hardiman said, we would, uh, we would want to do whatever we have to do down the line to rectify that. Any more observation, Hardiman? No, under the law of Moses, they weren't allowed to charge a brother interest, but they could lend with uh, others in mind and charge, even take their coat. Uh, at times, that, that was forbidden. If thou at all take thy neighbor's raiment to pledge, thou shalt deliver it unto him by, that the, uh, by the time that the sun goes down, in other words. Uh, so... Uh, there was uh, the fact that they could not use undue pressure upon individuals. I think that that's done today by a legal person called a corporation that has credit cards charging usury. Although the law doesn't say it's usury, they keep raising that, but charging such exorbitant rates that it even encourages some to go farther into debt than they ever can get out of under ordinary circumstances. If they just realized how long it takes to pay off a 21% interest loan, uh, they would find out that they're barely making much more than the interest payments on what is required each month. Now the law of Moses forbade that kind of action. And we today, as Christians, ought to do just that. I heard my father say one time, whenever I found out near the end of his life that he didn't even know how much he had in his banking account, his checking account, which turned out to be far more than he realized. 
because he didn't keep a bank balance. Uh, I, I, of course, was horrified about that because if I didn't keep the bank balance, I'd have too much month at the end of my money. <laughs> and, uh, and so it scared me to death until I found out that it was a rather large sum that he had in his. I said, Dad, why don't you take that money and put it into a CD or a savings account? He said, I've never, ever charged anybody interest in my life. I said, don't you think you're allowed to do that? He said, you can do it if you want to, but I don't want to. Very interesting. Uh, I'm going to amplify just a little bit on this question. If we are to obey the laws of the land, which I think all of us agree that we should, is there ever a time that it would be all right for a Christian to exceed the speed limit? Let him that is without sin cast the first stone. <laughs> Well, in Dallas, they're beginning to make it necessary. I don't think that it deals with motives of the individual driver. If he is behind all of the police cars that are across all the lanes, going only at the speed limit, I think that they get no credit for obeying the speed limit under those circumstances. Uh, and uh, yet... It has become a real problem. Those laws are made for our benefit, and they ought to be kept. Now, if I had uh, someone in the car who is dying, I might want to speed and uh, do so carefully, I'd hope, but uh, to go beyond even the speed limit. Uh, but I would expect a ticket if I were stopped. I don't think that under ordinary circumstances we ought ever to violate that law. And yet, sometimes they'll almost shoot you if you block their lane, maybe actually shoot you in Dallas. That's because uh, this, this is the Metroplex where there's only two kinds of drivers, quick and the dead. <laughs> <laughs> I would say uh, Hardeman's example of... Um, a life and death situation, I believe that's built into our law. I don't believe you'd ever get a ticket. In fact, look at the vehicles that speed legally. Policemen, ambulances, fire trucks. That's built into it. That's not a violation of the law. That's part of the system or the legal uh, setup. Uh, you've seen cases where a man's speeding to get his wife to the hospital to deliver a baby. The police pulls him over as soon as he finds out what it is. He gets out front, turns his lights on, and helps him speed. So that's part, I believe that's part of our system. What if you're late to your preaching appointment? <laughs> <clears throat> As some are. This, this, um, uh, this happened to us on, a, on one occasion. My wife was driving. I was sitting over there writing shotgun and reviewing my sermon. <clears throat> and uh, she was exceeding the speed limit. And pretty soon there were those flashing lights. He pulled her over and came up to the window and he said, ma'am, you're uh, exceeding the speed limit. Is there some emergency? And she said, yes, I'm trying to get this preacher to the church on time for his sermon. He said, that's good enough for me, ma'am. Have a good day. <laughs> I could make an extra comment there, but I won't. Have, have, yes. Yes, sir. Hold on, there's a microphone coming to you. I think it was about a year ago on one of the um, numerous internet discussion groups, this question came up and was debated back and forth for a couple of months. Several of the brethren on that discussion group took it upon themselves to ask at the local law enforcement agencies, secretaries of state or whatever in their various locations. And I've forgotten how many states were checked. I think it was seven or eight every one of them came back and said, no, 65 means 65. You know, it's not like five miles an hour over, you're automatically allowed that. Every state said what's posted is posted. Uh, and one of the uh, men reported that uh, he was told by his state authority that so far as she knew that was the, the case in every state in the nation. Sometimes we use the excuse that, well, they'll always allow you five miles an hour over. The law may, 
but the law is not written as such and it's unethical to exceed the posted limit. I would say that that's a different situation than uh, an emergency situation as evidenced by the fact that those very authorities do what she just said they wouldn't do under their circumstances. The only thing I would add, all have sinned and fallen short. <laughs> Including Sonny Workman. <laughs> yeah, keep in mind who the driver was, would you please? Yes. Oh. <clears throat> Here is a rather uh, lengthy question, and yet it's a real good question. And uh, this, this goes back to, to giving. Uh, Dan Winkler presented a great sermon last evening on that subject. And uh, evidently the questionnaire understood him to say we should give in view of the gross income instead of the net income. And so this question, and there's several things involved here, so listen closely. Did tithing during the theocratic kingdom support both the physical government and the spiritual kingdom? That's the first part of the question. How significantly did that system change with the introduction of the kings when increased taxation for the additional government was inherent? Today, for typical employees, paychecks are decreased by 20 to 30 percent to support the federal government, Medicare, Social Security, taxes, etc. If God's established tithing in Israel supported both the government and the and the spiritual kingdom, should we assume that God still expects 10% minimum contribution of gross income in addition to the mandatory governmental support? Would it be more appropriate to give based on the earnings over which you have control? That is about 10 to 50% of one's actual paycheck. Well, I'll start that by saying, um, <clears throat> Uh, in my view, uh, when you look at your gross income, that's not, that doesn't all belong to you. You owe some of that. Uh, some of that money belongs to the government. It's not your money. Uh, so therefore, I don't subscribe to the view that we should give based on gross income. And I remember years back, um, the, um, the top income tax category for the exceptionally wealthy, uh, which I, probably none of us uh, came anywhere close to, was 90%. Am I not right? Those of you who have a few gray hairs, isn't that right? If they paid 90% of their income That's right. in uh, contributions, they were exempt from uh, even filing income taxes. Right. That's some time back. But here's my point. If the top income tax bracket was 90%, for an, uh, let's say a billionaire, and he's required to give 10% of his gross income, how much does he have left? Oh, more than None. That, that shows right there, there's something wrong with that idea. I think you have to give based on what is rightfully yours after you discharge your just debt to the government, which uh, tells you right up front that this is our money, not yours. I think that, that everybody has to admit that under the Old Testament, the courthouse and the church house were combined. Uh, to use that, to rephrase what that says there. And there were the obligations that they had uh, that came out of the tithe. But the tithe was not all that they paid each year. For instance, you have to consider the fact that Every third year, there was a second tithe, the widow's tithe. And then every seventh year, they had to let their ground lie fallow. They couldn't reap even if it came up wild. And then every 49th being a seventh year, as well as the 50th year, they couldn't plant. So they were giving far more than just... Uh, a, t a tenth. I do not believe the Bible has ever set for religious purposes just the tenth. It's never uh, forbidden more than that. Brother Dan Winkler, I thought, made some good points last night about the widow who gave all. And that was not condemned. Uh, but on the other hand, we do have the fact still remaining that if you look at all of those things that they paid, 
that likely more than 10% were religious duties and responsibilities because in addition to that, there were the animals that, the first uh, animal that came from uh, the womb. Uh, if it were a male, had to be bought and that money given. Uh, the first fruits of all their increase had to be given. There were many other things that they paid beside just the tithe. Some have said it might have been high, as high as 40% of a faithful been. Jew's uh, income. And yet part of that would have been like the courthouse uh, and would sustain some things that would be done by judges and kings and the like. Uh, but at the same time, I think that there's a principle, and I hope that all of us will remember it. With all of our blessings under the new covenant, I would be ashamed to stand before God in the day of judgment and let a Jew uh, outgive me. I'd be ashamed of it. I wish that there's something we could change. I told the preacher boys in a class that I teach on Fridays here, uh, and uh, I told them the other day, if there's one thing I could change about prayers that are offered at uh, the time that we usually take up a, a collection, it would be to forever get rid of the prayer that says, help us uh, to give a portion of that which we have uh, been blessed. I'd get rid of that phrase. I don't believe the Bible says you give a portion. It says give a proportion. Give as. That's proportionate. As you've been prospered. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Dave? I would want to do more study before I committed on this, but I, Gary, I'm inclined to think that, uh, that it has to do with all that we prosper. In other words, my, my responsibility to pay my federal taxes is no greater or less than my responsibility to pay my state taxes. That's no more or less uh, than my responsibility to pay my sales tax. If I go into a store and buy an, an item, you have to pay, what, eight, eight cents on the dollar here in this country? Uh, think of all of the other fees. Here in, in Texas, you have to have a, uh, you have to register your car. What's that, $50 or so every year? And you have to have it inspected. What are they charging for that now, 20 or something? If I sat That's down and money. figured out all of the things, and, and then what's the difference between that and my house payment? I have to have a house. So theoretically, couldn't I deduct everything that I feel is out of my control? Well, the difference is all those things are optional. Whereas if you earn money, the government says this much belongs to us. It doesn't belong to you. Was the question one that dealt with the adjusted gross income? Is that it? I thought it was. Uh, or just net. I think it was net. Uh, I think the basic question has to do, should we give on our gross income or on our net income, even though it's oh, yeah. much more complicated than that. And the question. net, isn't the net after all deductions? Uh, let me just hand it over there. <laughs> <laughs> it's all that top part. <laughs> well, my point is that uh, there are things that we are obligated to do. They're not yes. optional that go far beyond federal and state taxes. And so I'm just trying to figure out the rationale of how you would justify uh, not paying a proportion based upon your total income. Now, this is a moot point if what these two gentlemen are saying is true, and, and it is. That is that under the old law, by the time you looked at all of the tithes, you know, in, in Malachi 2, where uh, Malachi or God said, will a man rob God? And he said, wherein have you robbed me? And he said, in tithes, plural, and contribution. So if Gary's right that we're talking 40% of your income, what's it matter whether we do it on the gross or not? We've got a lot, a lot to make up. But a person hasn't been prospered on what he has. For instance, for it's one of those farmers back then was paying rent. That's not prosperity uh, to pay the rent. There are some, some costs that could be written off. Uh, before you count what you have been prospered, even in making a crop. And they would give the first fruits uh, of their prosperity. Mm -hmm. And uh, that wouldn't include the uh, money that it took to produce that. So there are some deductions that one could take, but to think that you could take all the deductions, 
so much per child and for all of those deductions and, and not give on those things would, would be, I think, to be an arbitrary look at what prosperity is. What we're really talking about would be something like a sharecropper, yes. uh, somebody who's renting a piece of ground under an arrangement where the owner says, I get 20% of your produce or, or 50% yes. or whatever. And that's mine. You can work the field, and you give. You got to give me half, half of what's grown. And so, what that man has that that belongs to him is only half in that case, not the entire thing. He's got to hand that over. And that, I think that's the situation between us and the government. They own part of that income. We own the uh, the rest of it. Let's go to another question. I have read articles from preachers and have heard preachers say it is wrong to dance, period. I can understand this view if the reference is made to certain dance moves or styles that are sexually provocative. But how could you say that it would be wrong to engage in a dance such as the waltz or even in square dancing when you consider that the dancers are dressed modestly and the dances are non-provocative in nature? Which one of you wants to say? Dave? Well, I'm still working on this tithing thing over here. <laughs> uh, I, I agree with the sentiment of, of the uh, questioner. They kind of have built in there their answer, and I agree with that. I think yeah. it's wrong. It's misleading for us to say all dancing is condemned. We, none of us believe that. Uh, could you, with your own mate in the privacy of your home, dance? Then dan all dancing is not wrong. Uh, the Bible depicts a number of occasions where dancing is apparently approved, you know, like Exodus uh, 15, Miriam and the other women. By the way, most of the dancing in antiquity was same-sex dancing. It was women with women, men with men. In uh, Luke 15, you remember when the prodigal son came home, what they do, among other things? They danced. And uh, so, it, it, granted, see, it wasn't a lascivious, modern, vulgar, scantily clad, all of that stuff that we know is wrong. Uh, that's what we should be condemning, in my opinion, and teaching our young people. We ought to be teaching them those things that are wrong and showing where those things can come into play in certain settings where dancing is occurring. But ultimately, it's those, those aspects that would make it wrong. Here again, uh, some people, th this might be another example of... Uh, of uh, what I brought up a little earlier about people just hearing something and automatically assuming that that's right. And, and sometimes people get way too simplistic regarding things like this, and they, um, they remember some preacher somewhere said, well, uh, um, dancing is lasciviousness. Lasciviousness is condemned. Therefore, all dancing is wrong. And there have been, by the way, Dave, some who have held the position that it would be sinful for a man and his wife to engage in dancing in their own bedroom. They could get into the bed and engage in sexual activity, but they couldn't dance. <laughs> there is the fact, however, that in doing anything, we have to deal with the end result of it. You have to often consider what others are thinking, what effect will this have upon them? And for that reason, you might want to forego some practices that others may know about that would be right in themselves if it tends to lead them into an offense. Romans 15 and chapter 14 as well deals with eating meats. And Paul pointed out, though he had a right to eat meats, if meat offended a brother and caused him to stumble in thinking that it was all right to eat meats offered to an idol, he said, I'll eat no more meat as long as the world stands. Now, that's under a certain circumstance where the effect and influence of it may cause another not to know the circumstances and would be led to sin. Uh, and so we have to consider what happens to others. And this is not uh, in any way to deny what has been said. That is true, that what has been said uh, concerning all dancing that is sinful is not true. But, and I've heard young 
women particularly, who would say, well, I've never had any evil thoughts. And I think they're telling the truth sometimes. I haven't heard too many boys say that. <laughs> uh, and I think there's a reason for that. But a part of lasciviousness is that which tends to produce lewd emotions, not in yourself only, but in others, the very meaning of the word. And so we have to consider what it does to others and the influence that it has, and then keep that in mind. Knowledge is a great thing, to know and to be able to distinguish things that differ. But as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, knowledge puffeth up, love edifies. In other words, you can say, well, I can make the distinction, and so what difference does it make about others? And ignore the greater law of love, love to them. And it would keep you from some actions that you have right to do. For instance, I don't think it's a sin to drink water out of a whiskey bottle, even with a label on it that says whiskey. But you think I'd do that in public? Not at all. It's because of what others may think. I have to consider others. Love for them, not wanting them to stumble would cause me not to do that. Very good. What is the difference between gambling and investing in the stock market? None, sometimes. <laughs> gambling doesn't mean taking a chance. A farmer takes a chance whenever he, uh, he himself uh, farms. In fact, there are a lot of chances involved in that. The weather and, and so many things. Uh, but it's not taking a chance. We do that in every business endeavor. There's a chance involved. And it's wrong to just say, what's wrong with gambling is that it takes a chance. Gambling is when, during taking chances, I win at the expense of everybody else. They have to lose. Now you say you do that business. No. There is an exchange of goods for services rendered. And that's right. But there isn't any such thing like that in, in gambling. When you win, everybody else loses. And that's violation of covetousness and of many other uh, sins, selfishness. It's on the wrong attitude. The Lord pointed out that we ought to work and receive things as a result of working. Uh, Gary, maybe you've got some things to add to that. I preached for four years in Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> and uh, never, I told somebody one time, some years after I left there, I said, you know, I preached four years in Las Vegas, Nevada, and never put a nickel in a slot machine. And that fellow said, how many silver dollars did you put in? <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, there, but, uh, but I... Seriously, uh, I never engaged at all in that four-year time with anything, not even in so much as a nickel in a slot machine. Uh, but I did invest in the stock market while I lived there. Mutual funds, I lost the money I invested. Uh, and well, you can make money out, as well. Which bears out what you said. But, but this is right, and Scripture says that we're to not be looking only to our own things, but to the things of others. Uh, Paul says that right here in Philippians 2, verse 4, not looking each of you to his own things, but each of you also to the things of others. Let, let each person not seek his own good, but, but the other person's good, and that's what's violated in gambling. You're after his damage in order to try to win. That's why gambling is wrong. I uh, was in a, uh, a gas station, some time back when there was a big sum evidently up on the lottery. And uh, I was standing in line, and I got up there and paid for the gasoline, and the fellow said, what else you want? I said, nothing, thank you. And I held out my hand for the ticket, and he said, don't you want some lottery tickets? I said, you've got more chance at, at being struck by lightning than you have winning the lottery. And I said it loud enough that everybody heard it in the line. And the woman behind me said, Lord, strike me. <laughs> I said, Father, forgive her, for she knows not what she says. 
I want to share with you a real funny story about Las Vegas. Uh, my brothers and I have a cousin named Ronnie Bourne. And if ever there was a man that lived that's pure in heart, Ronnie is pure in heart. He is the, one of the finest Christians you'll ever meet in your life. He was in the Air Force as a pediatrician, and they sent him to Nellis Air Force Base out in uh, Las Vegas. He had five little boys at the time. And of course, you can't go in a restaurant or anything out there unless there's these one-armed bandits. And so Ronnie would take occasion, because they were fascinated by what they saw, and he would try and teach them how wrong these things were and that they were associated with the mafia and all. And one day, his little boys were just uh, begging him, Daddy, let us put something in this machine. And so Ronnie thought to himself, he said, well, I'll teach them a lesson. It was a quarter machine. He said, see this quarter, boys? I'm going to go over there and put it in that machine to satisfy you all, and it'll take it. And that's going to go to the mafia. Maybe God will forgive me. Went over and put the quarter in there, hit the jackpot. <laughs> Quarters came out everywhere. His, his whole lesson went down the drain. <laughs> I have a related question I'd like to ask. Maybe you can answer it or uh, someone else. Uh, the man who was in the news recently, who won the, the biggest of all lotteries thus far, I think, uh, in West Virginia, and offered 10% of it to uh, the Salvation Army, and they refused to take it uh, because it was the produce of gambling. Uh, if it was offered here at Brown Trail, would you take the money? <laughs> Don't uh, ask Bobby. <laughs> 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 or Guy T. I think it's like my father said one time about uh, a bootlegger who had offered a rather large contribution to a congregation. And they asked Dad, what, what should we do about it? Should we take it? He said, the devil's had it long enough. Yeah. <laughs> well, the reason, reason I ask that question is um, I've told people several times I would take money from the devil himself to use in the Lord's work. I would rather the Lord's church have it than the devil have it. Why not take it and deprive him of being able to use it for some ungodly purpose. I think that fellow that you referred to did give to three different churches, didn't he? I think. That yeah, some were. others were a little more willing to take that. Yeah, by the way, he gave off the top, too. Mm -hmm. I think it was uh, the total amount he gave 10%. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, do you have anything to offer? On there was all? a TV program done some years ago on the lottery and gambling, and there's a transcript available. I was going to mention Matthew 25, where. Uh, Jesus told the um, one talent man that the very least he should have done was put that in a bank where it draw interest. But the implication was that he should have been taking that and investing it in some way in order to uh, increase. So the stock market, I think, would fit in that category. Amen. We have another question here that relates to speech. Uh, we've hit on some aspects of using the tongue in the wrong way. Dave said that there will probably be yes. Okay, uh, he's bringing you the microphone. I notice y'all spend a lot of time on the gambling aspect, which is pretty obvious, but whenever you're dealing with, with stocks, and, and uh, uh, I want to deal more with that and get your prospect on that, because... Um, as far as investing in a company, trying to give that company more money to, to grow or whatever it wants, and then if they do good, you get money back. I can see that as being a, an illegal increase. But there, there are lots of things in the stock market besides stocks. There's all kinds of speculative investment, options, futures, things like that. And a lot of these mutual funds and things invest in those types of things where everybody, anybody that wins, a lot of people have to lose. So I want to get your opinion on what's the difference. Well, I think that uh, I'd want to know what the mutual fund is investing in, what type of stocks. I wouldn't want to invest in Shenley breweries. 
or whatever the names may be. Uh, I, I think that we ought to invest in what is good, to do what is right. That's ethics. Maybe we need people up here who are more into finances than us. We're just preachers. We don't have any money. Yeah. Uh, but if I understand, I don't think I've ever had a mutual fund that was invested in futures. If I understand what it is, uh, like, uh, what is it, like pigs, pork, uh, pork bellies or something like that, isn't that futures? Uh, you're, you're, you're investing in something that you're hoping to get a certain market price for uh, six months down the road or something of that nature. Well, that's, that's all a farmer does. When he raises a pig, he, he, uh, he may have to buy that pig from his neighbor farmer, and then he feeds it a certain amount of money with the idea that he can eventually sell that pig for more money than he has invested in it. And so I see no difference between that and investing in futures in the stock market as I understand what they are, and I may be mistaken about it. So there may be exceptions. We, I don't think when we say it's okay to invest in the stock market that we're endorsing everything that goes on, but the principle of uh, investing in that way is not the same as the principles that are involved in gambling that you normally see when you think of gambling. They're different principles, different right. concepts. And, and as an investor in the stock market, you're, you're simply uh, one of the owners. It's no different from... Uh, being the, the sole owner and saying, well, I'm going to start me up a little uh, tiny uh, business over here in this shopping strip, and I'm going to go rent the property and then buy some clothes and try to sell some of them and make some money. And um, you're simply a partner in somebody else's business that is engaged in some kind of uh, enterprise to, to derive a profit in a legitimate way. If it's, uh, as these men have already said, if it's, uh, if it's an ungodly business, that's another matter altogether. All We've got several more good questions, but our time is about to run out. We've got only about eight minutes. And uh, looking over these questions, I don't know which one we could cover in eight minutes. But we'll go ahead and throw out one more with just maybe a very brief answer. What about social drinking for the Christian, according to the question? As I pointed out a while ago, there not only is uh, the regulation that God has given not to get drunk, but there, is, there are obligations that we have toward others as well. And uh, there is the fact that he warns us against anything that may war against our own soul. First Peter chapter 2, and I believe it's verse 11. Dearly beloved, uh, he pointed out, abstain from these things, fleshly lusts, that war against the soul. Now that covers a broad territory. If it wars against my soul, I need to abstain. That doesn't mean uh, to be moderate about it. Moderation is total abstinence when God approves of it, of what is wrong or what may war against my soul. On the other hand, it means moderation in what is right, not going overboard uh, in any direction, turning neither to the left nor to the right. And hence, uh, while one may not get drunk on a single drink, is this making me better now than it used to be? I, I often point out that if people knew what alcohol really was, and it's listed as a narcotic by the pharmacopoeia, uh, and not only that, a narcotic depressant. It's not a stimulant. It's a depressant. And uh, so... Uh, can this war against my soul? What are the dangers? I don't believe anybody ever started drinking and said with the first drink, I intend to become an alcoholic. One never knows. And why take the chance? Why begin something that might war against the soul? What is my influence upon others? 
Whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, do all to the glory of God. And uh, uh, Romans chapter 14 is, is good, good, sound, ethical <clears throat> advice to uh, commands upon how we ought to treat these various matters. And hence, while there may be occasions where one can drink and it be right, and I can think of a number medically. Uh, however, once when I mentioned medically, one of the doctors in the congregation came to me afterward and said, Hardiman, I know of no disease where alcohol is sometimes prescribed that today we do not have better medicines. So that may be an excuse that a lot of people use. Uh, but Timothy was to use a little wine for his stomach's sake and his often infirmities. That's medicinal and permitted under that. And yet, evidently, Timothy had not been using that because Paul said, use no longer water only. That is, you've been staying with water and in those countries, often contamination was a big problem. And so he was to use a little wine. Now, when it says use a little wine, I don't think he rubbed it on his stomach or head. He mm. took it. He drank it. And it wasn't grape juice either. No. <clears throat> it was alcoholic wine. Uh, those who have tried to, to uh, write on the subject, uh, some, of, some of those who have tried to write on this subject have gone too far and uh, have made a case that goes beyond what, what God's Word says. Let's summarize. I believe that God's Word says that drunkenness is sinful. Amen. There are plain scriptures to that effect, Revelation 21, 8, among others, uh, which in, indicates that you'll end up in the eternal punishment as a result of that kind of thing. But we're not talking about drunkenness here. We're talking about moderate drinking. I, I don't like the term social drinking because that funnels it into a certain category. If we're talking about social drinking where you're drinking in order to get into a party uh, with somebody or uh, to liven up the situation with other people, you see that, that that's funneling it a certain direction and I think there are uh, strong cautions against uh, that sort of thing. But when we're not talking about drunkenness, we, we have to recognize that we are talking about an, an area that is not black and white. Some brethren have gone so far as to say, and I have seen this in print, if you drink one drop, you are one drop drunk. And it is sinful to drink that one drop. Now brethren, that just can't hold water. Uh, Ephesians 5.18 says, be not drunken with wine wherein is excess. That's why it's wrong, it went too far. Uh, the same brethren who would write uh, that you cannot drink one drop probably have themselves taken cough syrup that had a small amount of alcoholic content in it and, and, and thought it was perfectly all right. And we have great inconsistencies along this line. But as Hardiman said, there are strong cautions in the Bible, and we have to review those cautions. <laughs> when we first went over to the Russian-speaking world to do mission work, um, it wasn't long before somebody asked me the, a question about this because drinking is is so um, uh, rampant over there and so a person that we had just baptized or maybe it was just before the baptism but studying with asked a question about it and I said I cannot give you a scripture that says that a small amount of alcohol let's say with your dinner uh, in, 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 in moderation would be sinful to do. What I can do is show you a number <laughs> of passages uh, that have strong cautions about that and, and tell you the reason for the cautions because the, the Word of God states the reason. And I think that's the way we have to approach the question, not going so far as to um, go beyond the Word of God. They, there is... Uh, there's simply not time to, to explore some of the things that um, I think deserve to be explored. Of course, one would be even the definition of drunkenness in Scripture. 
my understanding is the modern parallel term to that's intoxication. Our um, state officials have said for many years that 0 0.10 alcohol, blood alcohol content is uh, sufficient for you to not operate a vehicle. They have dropped that to 0 0.08. And understand that they mean by that, not that you are uh, not intoxicated until that point. They're not saying that. They're saying at that point you're sufficiently intoxicated that you shouldn't be driving a vehicle. So even <clears throat> secular authorities agree that intoxication occurs sometime before that. Um, we need to discuss uh, the, the actual, <coughs> what we're talking about. What do you mean by wine? And of course, any bottle of wine on any shelf in this country, as I understand it, is not equivalent to the wine of the Bible. They did not have the capabilities that we have with our refined uh, processes to produce as potent a product. They generally had to add a narcotic or a drug to it, mix it, in order to bring its potency up. Therefore, you would obviously have to drink larger quantities for it to have the effect that smaller amounts today have. So we're comparing apples and oranges. So many times the Bible speaks very negatively about that substance. And what I'm finding in my study, I still have a ways to go on this, what I'm finding in my study is where it's spoken of positively, there's good textual evidence it's not intoxicating. You have to remember that the Hebrew word, uh, and by the way, there's about eight different words in Hebrew that refer to this, but the main one, wine, yayin, and its New Testament counterpart, oinos. Anytime you see the English word wine in your Bible or anywhere else in your life, you immediately think intoxicated. That's the only wine you know. But that is not the meaning of those original words. They are generic terms for the juice of the grape. And therefore, they're used to refer to juice before it's squeezed, when it's still in the grape, they're used to refer to newly squeezed, fresh, must, and they're used to refer to grape juice that has, in fact, been fermented and turned uh, into an intoxicating beverage. And so you can't just take these terms and indiscriminately treat them as if uh, they are endorsing it. And uh, as I said, we just don't have time to go into all the details. But if, in fact, in 1 Timothy, uh, Paul was enjoining upon... Uh, Timothy, actual alcoholic beverage. And Gary, I want more, more evidence to prove that that's the case. Not only does that prove, number one, as Hardiman said, that he never drank before. He was not a drinker of intoxicating beverage prior to that. He had to be told to do it. And number two, as Hardiman said, that was purely medicinal, and the term little is used, a very small quantity, which it seems to me would be equivalent to our cough syrups today and in no way should be used as a passage to endorse social drinking, as the questioner has asked about, or even, in my opinion, drinking in moderation. I think that's a stretch to take that passage. Um, there was a fellow back in Tennessee that uh, was looking into this question, and once he found out that uh, you could drink for medicinal purposes, he went out and started shaking the bushes for snakes, hoping to uh, have a reason to drink. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm, I'm not one of the panelists, but I still think there's a simple solution to that. Jesus said, you shall know a tree by the fruit that it bears. And the tree of alcoholic beverages has borne nothing but pain and suffering and heartache and abused children and battered wives and broken homes and lost jobs ad infinitum. And then the Bible says, abstain from every form of evil. So why mess with this stuff? Let me just, uh, in my closing remarks here, just quote one passage, Proverbs 20 and verse 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Who's deceived by it? The one that leaves it alone for fear that it may lead to that? Or the one who says, I can drink and it won't bother me? I want to thank the uh, three men that have been on this forum each day. I think they've all done a super job. I really do. And, and I love each one of you, and I appreciate you more than I can say. And uh, we appreciate your presence for these forums, the interest that you've manifested. And uh, if you like this sort of a format, well, we'll try and incorporate it into the lectureship again next year. 
But for right now, we're going to be dismissed. We urge, urge all of you to be back at 6.30 tonight for uh, the singing and then the two lectures that will follow. We have two good ones lined up. Brother Jim Law sitting right down here is going to be the first speaker at 7, Brother Paul Sane at 8. And both of these gentlemen are great gospel preachers, so I know you'll profit by it. Let's bow our heads for a brief word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. <clears throat>